let's discuss why paralegals and other non-attorney legal professionals should understand judges and the judiciary by attending panels where judges are speaking or attending speeches that judges offer to a public audience. Hello everyone, my name is Fatima Mahmoud. Welcome and welcome back to my channel. This video reflects my own views and opinions, no one else's, and it's not been pre-approved or endorsed by any federal agency or other employer, academic program, or membership association. I believe that not only is it important for paralegals to understand their own paralegal careers and the careers of other paralegals, it's important that they understand the legal profession as a whole. Within the context of the court system, it becomes important to understand the educational background, the on-the-job training, and the work experience of job groups such as judges, law clerks, and other court staff in order to have a broader and holistic picture of the whole legal profession. Doing that can only strengthen a paralegal's role in the whole legal profession. Of course, it's easy to understand that attorneys might go to legal conferences where there are judicial panels and they want to network with judges as directly as they can. Of course, we understand that attorneys might want to go to speeches um, given by individual judges to learn from them and to network with them. At the same time, I, I think that non-attorney legal professionals should also not hesitate to do the same. As with any other group, some judges might be more open to that than other judges, but you find out after you try to go to these events, learn from them, and try to network with them, at least introduce yourself as a legal professional to them. I want to ensure there is no misunderstanding or miscommunication that the information in this presentation are not direct quotes from judges, rather they are taken from my notes, my impressions, and my recollections from these conferences. One conference I attended was hosted by the South Asian Bar Association of North America. The theme of the conference, this is their annual conference, was Making Monumental Strides occurred in Washington, D.C. in July 2017. The first judicial session I attended was a parallel panel session so people could choose to go to this or other topics. This panel was called How to Be a Better Advocate, so judges are advising attorneys on how to be a better advocate for their clients when they are in court. The moderator was Tiru Vignaraja, the judges that were presented, and again, I haven't noticed if there if there are any um, substitute judges or substitute panelists that happened last minute. The Honorable Amit Mehta, District Court Judge for the U.S. District for the District of Columbia. The Honorable Justin Anand, U.S. Magistrate Judge for the Northern District of Georgia. The Honorable Jaslavin Lal, Magistrate Judge for the Magistrate Court of Fulton County, Georgia. The Honorable Sanjay Taylor, Associate Judge for the Circuit Court of Cook County, Illinois. These are the notes that I took that I'm going to share with you. Again, there are no direct quotes from any of the judges. The advice the judges on the panel gave to lawyers about how to become better advocates. They emphasize the importance of quality written work product, the things that you're going to brief or plead with the courts. There's so much that happens before a trial that it's important to marshal the facts in a compelling way. When you're in an oral argument, it's very important to answer whatever question the judge is asking very concisely. Try not to, as a lawyer, have any conflict between doing the right thing and advocating effectively for your clients. Never damage your reputations. Make sure that your word can be a word that's taken seriously that you are someone who can be relied upon to do what you said you will. Be the person that people believe in when you say you're gonna do something. Your word and your integrity is a tool and not just an annoyance. Be forthright and truthful. Once you lose those things, they can be lost forever. Be very punctual and on top of your dockets. Be considerate of all the other people involved in the trial. Special advice to lawyers who come from underrepresented community is to rise above the bigotry and the ignorance 
uh, while still making sure that you don't get put down. Always remember that judges talk to each other, so keep that in mind, especially if you're ever in a situation where you might be judge shopping. They got very technical in some areas and talking about citation and legal briefs about non-binding cases, and a point was raised that there's no legal obligation uh, to cite to non-binding cases. But again, that's a very technical aspect for lawyers to think about. When the judge is speaking or when the judge is asking questions, listen to what the judge is saying out loud. Sometimes they do think out loud and they might be seeking to validate thinking or they're playing devil advocate. So that's a part of learning how to read the judge. And there's a book they recommended called The Art of Lawyering. Again, they go back to just answer the judge's questions clearly. You might preface that by saying, judge, I will answer your questions. I just want to say, and then explain what you needed to say. They reminded the attorneys that judges won't necessarily make decisions until they hear both sides of the story or the arguments. And that can, oral advocacy, oral arguments can, can help change the color of the case. Be prepared if you have the rare opportunity to explain things before a judge so that the trial and all the proceedings aren't just happening on paper. It's important to know when to stop talking and to sit down. Always think about why people should care about this particular case and work that into helping the judge understand the moral imperative of the case. They talked about the decline in the practices of oral advocacy. One of the factors is the expense of litigation and the cost of e-discovery. So actually going to trial before and being before a judge does cost the client a lot more money versus handling everything in the case or the investigation on paper or even settling beforehand. They reminded the attorneys that judicial credibility relies on transparency and the, the public seeing that justice is an action that is intact. They talked about strengthening your advocacy and focusing on the merit of your case and find ways to disagree without being disagreeable when it comes to the two parties. They advise that attorneys hold off in developing a defense until they have a strong factual basis for their case. Judges are often reluctant to raise issues that both parties did not raise in an ordinary civil case. These parties may have had a very good reason and they might have discussions before trial as to why not to raise those issues. Judges might be a little bit more open to raising new issues and giving clear notice in a criminal case compared to a civil case. Some types of questions that judges will ask is if there's a discrepancy between pleadings and what's presented in the oral arguments because the judges want to make sure that procedural fairness is vital to the courts and it's very important for judges to follow procedural rules to ensure fairness and equity. One of their top advices for attorneys looking to develop oral argument skills was to in-person witness as many oral arguments as possible. And there's a great quote that was presented that all cases, and I would say all investigations, are in the shadow of potentially being litigated or going to trial. There was, of course, a reference to the movie My Cousin Vinny that focuses on what good cross-examination should look like. So if you haven't seen the movie My Cousin Vinny, take a look, especially during the cross-examination. And last tidbit, if you're arguing in court and the other side is making lots of comments and objections, well, objections are fair things to make, but to, one option is to ask the judge to instruct the opposing counsel to defer comments until it is that person's turn. The second judicial presentation of that conference was a lunch plenary session with panels with all the judges that all the audience members would attend. And this one was called Pathways to the Bench. The moderator was Paul Grewal, former U.S. magistrate judge, and at that time, Facebook's vice president and deputy general counsel. The judges present were the Honorable Sri Srinivasan, judge for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District Court of Columbia Circuit, the Honorable Ravi Sandil, 127th District Court in Harris County, Texas, Honorable Amul Tapar, Judge for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, the Honorable Raja Rajeshwari, Criminal Court Judge of the Office of Court Administration in Staten Island, New York. The judges talked a lot about that the view from the bench is very different compared to being litigator or an advocate of your clients. Here, judges have to listen to both sides of the argument in court 
and there's more reflecting going on. And at times as a judge, you might have to, especially if you're a newer judge, uh, you have to rule against people you were once close to professionally. One of the important skills in the tool skit of judges is the ability to work in concert with others, especially if you're on a panel of judges, like a full court circuit panel, and there are three judges. In that type of setting, at the federal circuit courts, the Oral arguments are the first time that one judge hears the other judge's opinion on the case. Often, the judges can go into conference pretty quickly soon after oral arguments. In some case, in some areas, the tradition is for the junior judge to go first in the conference and share their thoughts and views on the case and the materials presented. Judges in those situations recommend to explore common ground among the judges and learn from how colleagues uh, see things differently than themselves. Sometimes judges, through their questioning of the advocates, are actually talking and communicating with each other. Especially on hard cases, judges do work together to find a common ground on their opinions and what their decision is going to be, to understand each other's perspective. And even experienced judges can learn from this process. Different cases that come before judges can be different for varying reasons. Interesting issues can come up in any case on any subject matter. So the work of law clerks who are directly assigned to judges is very challenging work. And then there's a trade-off that if a judge really enjoys spending time with their clerk and hearing what their clerk has to say, that means even longer hours for the law clerk. So keep that in mind when you're dealing with law clerks in the court system. The judges also talked about to remember that all judges are working hard and this is happening at different levels at state and federal. Some judgeships like the appellate judgeship can be some of the most isolating experiences because there has to be a certain gap between the judges and attorneys that they socialize with or connect with professionally so that there is not an issue of impartiality, there needs to be a little bit of a gap, especially when that socializing and professional networking happens. So that it ends up that judges really spend a lot of time professionally socializing with other judges. And so within the legal community, the number of judges and the community of judges is much smaller. So you have to take that into account. So judgeships that are not necessarily appellate judgeships um, are a little bit less isolating, but appellate judgeships can be more isolating because of the condensation of the circles of where you can actually socialize and share your professional insights and concerns and development with people. I've heard a similar thing mentioned in Justice Sonia Sotomayor's um, memoir that she wrote or autobiography that she wrote. They also pointed out that an appointment to the federal court system is it can end up being a, a lifetime commitment to public service, so keep that in mind. And sometimes the process to be appointed to the to the federal courts is a very challenging process on a personal level and it's important to be discreet and also guarded about how much information uh, you are sharing about not only your personal life but your professional life and when it is appropriate to share and give people a heads up who are helping you go through the process and when not to. It's also mentioned that in order to get a lot of these endorsements to help along the federal process, have to be prepared to answer lots and lots of questions about yourself and your background. The more recent judicial panel I attended was hosted at the annual conference of the National Association of Muslim Lawyers. This was hosted in Las Vegas, Nevada in November 2022. And again, these are just my notes and impressions and not direct quotes from the judges. This panel was called Muslims in the Judiciary, Challenges and Experiences. And of course, it was a plenary session, so all the audience members could uh, listen to it without having to select a different parallel session. And these judges talked about the challenges they faced as Muslims, as well as their pathway journeys to the bench. The moderator was Chundum Lopez, a judicial law clerk. The panelists that were present were the Honorable Dania Ayubi, Administrative Law Judge, Maryland Office of Administrative Hearings, Honorable Rabia Collier, Harris County Judge, Texas 113th District, Honorable Mustafa Kasubhai, U.S. Magistrate Judge, District Court of Oregon, the Honorable Zahid Qureshi, United States District Judge, District of New Jersey, the Honorable Ruksana Singh, U.S. Magistrate Judge for the District of New Jersey discussed in the early process of becoming a judge is that if underrepresented communities want 
more judges who reflect them and their experiences, then those communities have to support people who are seeking to become judges and to accept the diverse range of experiences and positions and views that those candidates themselves have. One of the things that comes up, particularly if you're a religious minority, particularly a Muslim judge, is early in the process of trying to become confirmed or even nominated or selected on a shortlist is the question, are you more Muslim or less Muslim? And how that can be a coded question for are you trying to bring Islam or Sharia law into the American court system? So that's something that judges have to deal with and watch out. Once people do become judges, a lot of them have to deal with threats against them just for coming from the backgrounds. Of course, this might happen to Muslims, but this can also happen to judges from other up underrepresented communities. People just concerned about whether the judges are there for the system or they're there for a community, or one particular community. There can be an impact on defendants, particularly in a criminal court setting, if they come into the courtroom and they see a judge who's based on their name or their look can appear to be Muslim. One thing that the defendant can walk away with is perhaps because this judge is from an unrepresented community, maybe my own race, my own religious background, my color won't be used against me in this system. At the same time, judges from Muslim backgrounds or other unrepresented backgrounds have a consciousness of being aware of you know, tokenism and not wanting to be one person who represents the entire community. Sometimes even defendants can get confused. They may see a judge of their similar background, especially a religious background, and misinterpret this as the judge is also there to deal with a moral judgment when it comes to that defendant. And judges have to emphasize or re-explain that they are judges in this court of law and only that. A key takeaway that sort of the panel ended on was the importance of judge not only receiving support from their underrepresented communities, but that judges really do work a lot with other judges. They'll have ongoing communication. They'll even have uh, text groups with other judges. So the importance of getting support from existing judges becomes even more important if you come from an underrepresented background. I encourage paralegals and other non-attorney legal professionals to obviously attend judicial panels and judicial speeches and try to network with judges and law clerks. If you have a high school or college alumni database and you can search for it, for judges, definitely utilize that as a resource. As we all know, different judges will respond differently to connecting with someone who's not an attorney and not already a judge, but you won't find out until you try. Thank you for watching my video. I'd love to hear from you on email at fmahmood at wellesley.edu. You can also find me on LinkedIn at that address. And if you do send me a connection request, please go ahead and send me a note. Before you go, please like, comment, share, and subscribe to my channel. I'd really appreciate it. And please go ahead and watch my next video. Thank you.